evening and welcome to our kickoff Hewerman of, of 2020. Hard to believe uh, 2020 is here. It doesn't seem that long ago when we were all worrying about having electricity at the turn of the millennium, but we've made it. Uh, this is our second Hewerman lecture of the 1920 academic year, and uh, we're excited to have you here, Alina, um, to visit with us. Um, we're also glad to have you here, uh, here in the audience, but also those who are um, listening and engaging through our live video stream. The theme of this season's uh, Hewerman lecture is around resilience in agricultural ecosystems. The Hewerman lectures in the Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources are made possible by a gift from Keith and Norma Hewerman uh, from Phillips. Keith phoned today and uh, just wasn't feeling up to uh, joining us. Normally he sits right here in the front. I'm sure Keith and his family are listening. So Keith and Norma, thank you very much for your generous gift. The, uh, the spirit of the Hewerman is an opportunity to bring speakers from around the world to Nebraska to engage us in our uh, commingled journey of exploring the complexities of the world in which we live, especially focused on the production of food, fuel, feed, and fiber, doing that in a manner that ensures the sustainability of our critical natural resources, our natural ecosystems, our water, our air, our soils, with a mind and an eye on the resilience of the people, mostly in rural Nebraska, that produce that food here and around the world. So it's in that spirit that we gather today. If you're interested and you're listening online when we get to the Q&A session, you can simply text your question or your comments to uh, hashtag HL series and we'll pick it up and we'll see that Alina gets the question uh, or, the, or we'll share your comment. The format of the evening is similar to previous Hewerman lectures. Uh, Dr. Bennett will have 40 to 50 minutes to share her perspectives and then we will have an open mic um, there will be two microphones that are floating. Uh, just raise your hand and we'll get the microphone to you for the Q&A session. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Elena Bennett. Uh, Elena is the pr uh, professor and chair in sustainability science in the Department of Natural Resource Sciences at McGill, at McGill School of Environment at McGill University in Montreal. Uh, we were chatting a little bit today. It's balmy here in Lincoln, and uh, she appreciated that. Uh, I'll share a couple of things with her permission. Um, actually, she's coming home. That's not in the script. She was here, lived in Nebraska, here in Lincoln, when she was 8 to 10 years old. So um, welcome home uh, through and through Nebraskan. Uh, Alina received her bachelor's degree from Oberlin College in Oberlin, Ohio, uh, where she studied environmental studies. She also was a varsity soccer player, as I understand, um, not too far from where I grew up, Alina. She earned, she earned both her master's in land resource sciences and her PhD in limnology and marine sciences from the University of Wisconsin, another fine Big Ten school in 1999 and 2002, respectively. Her work focuses on ecosystem services, especially on the interactions among ecosystem services and how we can manage these interactions for more multifunctional, sustainable, and resilient landscapes. She was the leader of the Mont Montaregie, close, Montaregie Connection Project, which aimed to work with stakeholders to understand the role of landscape connectivity in the provision of about a dozen ecosystem services and how those might change across a range of future scenarios. I think we might call that today uh, climate adaptability in some of our work here. Her most recent work focuses on using radical transformative experiments in society as seeds, if you will, to help better tell stories about how we might uh, better achieve a balanced or good Anthropocene. Anthropocene. 
Dr. Bennett was a Leopold Leadership Fellow in 2012, was named a Trottier Public Policy Professor in 13 and 14. She won the McDonald Campus Award at McGill for undergraduate teaching in excellence and the Carrie Derrick Award for excellence in graduate supervision. Uh, through and through, we're blessed to have a well-rounded and balanced scholar. Dr. Bennett, thanks for coming down and visiting with us today. We look forward to your talk. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mike, for that. Uh, that's a really nice introduction, getting all the dirt out. But I, but I do sometimes wonder if it was, you know, living here in Lincoln across the street from cornfields that has driven me towards agriculture for, for so long. Uh, at any rate, I'm delighted to be here and have a chance to talk to you a little bit. And what I'm really gonna try to do is just open up a conversation, put out some ideas, and uh, see where that takes us over the next hour or so. And I wanna start right here, where we are today, in the Anthropocene. And the scale of the human impact on the planet right now requires that we define for ourselves a new geologic era. And this is an era uh, that's characterized by land cover change, by biodiversity loss, by pollution, by massive population growth, climate change, and also by, on average, increases in human well-being around the planet driven primarily by better access to food and nutrition, all of which uh, have global implications. And, and the Anthropocene, it's not geologically an official era. Uh, it's just an agreed upon name for the time period that we're in right now. It gives us a way of talking about the kind of change that we're seeing, a term that helps us to understand the magnitude of human impact on the, on the planet. So what I want to talk about today is what does this, the Anthropocene, mean for the future of life on planet Earth, uh, for our security, and what are our responsibilities as a human community in the Anthropocene to ensure that we have continued security? So let me put some numbers on that uh, change. And so what you're looking at here uh, is records from ice cores over uh, the last 100,000 years that give us uh, some sense of what temperature change was probably like. And what you can see if you start on the left 100,000 years ago and come across this way is a lot of bouncing around. And, and every time we get a real extreme bounce, we get some sort of human migration from uh, one place to another as people try to avoid these bounces in, in climate. Um, but what I really want to draw your eye to is right there at the end. So that is the last 11,700 years. It is an official geologic era called the Holocene, and it is the only state of the Earth system that we know for certain can support contemporary human societies. So everything, when you think about human history, everything in human history happens during that time period. That is all of agriculture, that's Greeks, that's Romans, that's Chinese civilization, it's everything uh, that we know. And, and we don't know what, what happens after that, uh, except that we're headed out of that Holocene. If we look at the very most recent uh, temperature records, we see that we're headed out of that Holocene. We're headed into something different, and we don't fundamentally understand what that means for security and for the future of life on this planet. So for the rest of the talk, I want to turn a little bit to agriculture. Uh, and I want to focus on agriculture for a few reasons. So you know, one is just agriculture is really important uh, in the world, especially maybe here in Nebraska. And it's a very, very interesting case study. Uh, and I want to start thinking about this with a really simple premise, and that is this. We've had 10,000 years of agriculture on the planet. Uh, how can we continue to have agriculture for the next 10,000 years? So I'm not interested in 20 years of resilience or 100 years of resilience. I want to go all the way and think about 10,000 years uh, of change on the planet. And so to get a sense of the magnitude of that 
change, I want to just talk about a thousand years of change uh, here in North America. So this is uh, an artist's rendition uh, of a place called Cahokia, which is uh, just outside of St. Louis. Uh, it's a large, probably the largest Native American uh, city from uh, that time period, about year 1000, so about a thousand years ago. And what I want you to do is think about if you were a person living at this time, standing in the middle of this community and trying to say, well, this is what's gonna happen a thousand years from now, that's what that same place is going to look like. And the reason I bring that up is uh, just simply to say that thinking about long time frames, 10,000 years, even a thousand years is incredibly difficult. It's really hard for us to do. It's hard for us to even think about five or 10 or, or 20 years out into the future. So we're really gonna try to expand our mindsets uh, out to that 10,000 year uh, time frame. And I have two main ideas uh, that I want to uh, put out there that are why I think to me that we really need to think about the, the long-term future. And one is we are very clearly, and I would argue unnecessarily threatening security by undermining natural and human capital, especially in our agricultural system. So the way that we're running things right now is not good for our chances of continuing to have agriculture for another 10,000 years and that we can do better. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on what I mean by threatening the natural capital and then a little bit of time on how I think that we can uh, go about uh, doing better. Okay. So before I do that, I want to give a little bit of an introduction to resilience, at least as I see it, just so I can make sure that we're all on the same uh, page. And resilience is a really widely used concept in science, in management, in policy. It's obviously something that you're thinking about a lot here at the university. And it's a concept that has multiple meetings, and I'm gonna use it to mean the extent to which a system can develop with change by absorbing disturbances, by coping with uncertainty and risk, and still sustaining key properties. So we might say for agricultural systems, that's uh, the capacity to produce food or the capacity to sustain rural livelihoods and communities. And we often talk about this using these sort of two-dimensional ball in cup diagrams, and the ball here represents the current state of the system. So that might mean uh, the amount of grass, shrub, and livestock in a Nebraska uh, landscape. And that little cup is what we call a basin of attraction. And so it, that basin keeps the system as it is now with the, the amount of grass and shrub that it, that it currently has. Um, but the way that we change the system uh, can affect the depth of that cup and can make that ball flip into uh, different kinds of systems, fundamentally changing the system from maybe one that's grassland dominated to a system that is uh, shrub dominated. And let me give a couple of uh, examples. So an example that I'm most familiar with from uh, limnology uh, is this water system where we might have a clear water desirable state and then we do some things that that change the system. So we might be using a lot of fertilizers in our agricultural system that causes phosphorus uh, that's in those fertilizers to build up in the soil and in the mud. Uh, and then if we have on top of that a system that has some flooding, warming, where we're overfishing our top predators, we can shift that system into a turbid water state from which it's very difficult to return to our, our clear water state. Uh, an example that's maybe a little closer to home here for grassland systems, we might have a desirable uh, grassland. If we do a lot of fire prevention in that grassland, trying to keep it the way that it is, and then we're faced with uh, heavier rains or heavier grazing, we might see a, a shift into an undesired shrub and bushland uh, system. So two examples. Okay, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, how we define security. So one thing I did was went and looked at the Huberman website 
to see how you define security, uh, and that is as enough to sustain the world and secure the sustainability of rural communities where the vital work of producing food and energy occurs. And, and I, I like that definition quite a lot. And another little piece that I want to bring out in that definition is the idea that security is also freedom from. So the, the way it's defined on the website is a freedom to, but we also often think about it as freedom from. Freedom from danger, from fear, anxiety, uh, or poverty. And, and the reason that I'm bringing that up, the reason that's important is because what we think is causing our insecurity becomes a big part of how we go about trying to achieve security. So if we perceive, for example, the threat as being about a lack of near-term income, we're gonna perceive very different solutions than if we perceive the threat as being a steady rundown of, of natural capital in our agricultural systems. And in fact, as we'll, you'll see as we go along in this talk, a lot of the things that we're doing to try to achieve short-term stability uh, often create a system that can shift us to this undesirable state that actually undermine our long-term uh, long security. So if you think back to the grassland example, uh, for example, um, fire prevention, it's a great strategy for short-term maintenance of that, of that grassland system, but it's a very poor strategy for long-term maintenance of that system. So we're sort of trading off our short-term stability for our long-term security or resilience. Okay. So with that in hand, I want to now talk through a little bit the current state of agriculture, mostly in a global sense, and show how in many cases what we've done is grow a system that focuses on the shorter term stability in favor of long-term resilience and how that is sometimes undermining our resilience or our long-term sustainability by increasing risk uh, and decreasing security. And then I'm going to open into some conversations about uh, what it is that we can, can do about it. And the, the biggest gist, the overarching idea for me is agriculture is a balance of two really opposing things. So on the one hand, it's one of the most important keys to human well-being. We just don't exist if we don't eat, for starters. But also agricultural development in many parts of the world is a, a significant and really important force in bringing communities out of, out of poverty. On the other hand, and at the same time, agriculture is probably the single biggest cause of environmental degradation as we look around the world. And so how do we hold those two ideas together uh, at the same time and understand how we walk forward with, with agriculture? So when we think about nutrition, we know that one in nine people in the world are undernourished and with population pressure increasing, consumption changing, especially uh, towards increased meat consumption in the fastest growing parts of the world like India, also meat consumption in China, we have an immense pressure to grow more food and to get that food, both nutrients and calories to the people who need it and to do this quickly and to do it efficiently. So what does our agricultural system look like then? Uh, so this is showing cropland area uh, in the year 2000. And what you can see is that cropland covers a lot of area. It covers about 30% of the global productive land area. So the darker areas here have more cropland, the lighter areas have less, and a lot of that cropland is, is right around here uh, in the Midwest of, of North America. If we add in pasture land, now pasture's covering another substantial portion of the planet, around 40% plus or minus, depending a little bit on how you count what pasture land is. So a total of about 70% of the productive surface of Earth is land that has been converted for agriculture, either pasture uh, or cropland. That's a lot of habitat, and that is problematic for species that don't like to coexist with agriculture, like those that require large habitat, large natural areas, uh, or can't withstand a lot of, uh, a lot of human contact. 
So what else do we know about agriculture right now? So now I'm showing you uh, crop yields. This is average yields for the 16 major crops that are grown, and the data is compiled by fusing agricultural census records from around the world with satellite images of where agriculture is. And again, the darker green colors have uh, higher yields, and the lighter green have, have lower yields. And a couple of things to take away from this. One is that agricultural yields are quite high, and another is that they vary around the world due to things like climate, uh, management practices, and even the mix of crops that are grown uh, in any one, one area. And if we zoom in just a little bit and look here just at corn yields and just in the United States and its data from a little bit before 1900 uh, to 2014, um, what you can see is a pretty striking increase uh, in yields over time. A little bit of bouncing around, but on the whole, a really striking uh, increase uh, in, in yields. And so what have we done to create those yields? How has this evolved that we have 70% of our land surface in agriculture with these really remarkable yields and yet still aren't somehow managing to get nutrients to people who need it and feed the planet? So in general, in order to achieve these increases in production and the improvements in human well-being that go along with them, we've created uh, what some people are now calling a global production ecosystem. And so what do I mean when I say global production ecosystem? I really mean three things. One, we've converted large portions of the biosphere to a highly simplified production. Two, we've increased intensification, and I'm gonna include in intensification the suppression of natural variance or change in the system. And three, we've expanded the connectivity of our agricultural systems. And what I'm gonna do now is just walk through each of these and talk a little bit about the implications for security and for the resilience of the, the Earth system in the Anthropocene. So let me start with, uh, with simplification and intensification of, uh, of production. So in addition to just the conversion of land to agriculture, agriculture, which takes a very complex system and makes it quite simple to begin with, um, we're also creating a much more simple agriculture. Uh, agriculture itself is becoming less diverse over time. So where we used to have an agricultural system that varied a lot by location, where you might have crops grown that were very specific to the region, now we have generally a few types of crops, maybe maize, wheat, rice, and barley, that are grown in the vast majority of all of our agricultural land. And even more striking, actually, is the, the meat products that we're growing. So if we take uh, pigs, which I think are about 40% of all global meat production, and chicken, 34, chicken? Uh, sorry, uh, cattle, 34% uh, of all global meat production. So just those two animals alone account for 75% of all of the global meat production. Two species, 75% of all the meat that we're producing and, and consuming on the planet. So we're taking a very, very diverse system and simplifying it down and making it more homogenous all around the world. And so what does that do? What are the implications of that sim simplification? And most importantly, the implications are, are a loss of stability. Our systems are more sensitive to disease, they're more sensitive to pest outbreaks. They're more sensitive to sudden changes in demand, uh, to widespread drought or other climate events, simply because everyone everywhere is growing the same set of crops. And so we're all affected in the same way, rather than a system that's more diverse where some people are going to be affected differently than others. Okay. So one more thing about uh, intensification is about the use of external uh, inputs. So production systems, as you all know, have a really high reliance on capital to grow food. So that could be and, and used to be natural capital, so where we needed uh, really, good, um, uh, really good soil quality, uh, really good uh, access to water, um, et cetera, maybe pollination to grow crops. But over time, as we've moved towards more intensified systems, we're increasing our anthropogenic input 
uh, in those systems and decreasing our reliance on natural systems. So we're adding in technology, plowing, fossil fuels, capital investments, fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides to uh, account for the capital needs that it takes to, to produce agriculture. And so what's the, the, the uh, implication of that and of the suppressed variance? Because intense, this sort of intensification often goes hand in hand with suppressing variants. So I talked about uh, pesticides. So that sort of suppression you might think about is that's about controlling stressors on the system, like fires or pest outbreaks. And there's a really important role, of course, of suppressing those things in agriculture to enhance our short-term stability. Um, but there are long-term implications for the resilience. So for one thing, if we are constantly suppressing pest outbreaks, it reduces our ability to select for tolerant traits in the crops that we're growing. It also tends to accumulate variants in the longer term. So for example, in forested areas where we're suppressing wildfire, we're accumulating more fuel that can lead to larger fires uh, ultimately. And then finally, it's removing useful warnings of, of declining resilience. So we're not getting the, the warning signals of pest outbreaks anymore. We, we lose all of, those, uh, all of those things in the system when we're suppressing variants. Okay, so we talked about uh, converting to simplified production and we talked about intensification and suppressing variants. And so the third thing that I wanted to talk about with the current state of agricultural systems is about expanding the connectivity of the system. And so uh, what I'm showing here is, uh, I think it's maize, um, cereal, so all cereals that are exported from the United States to every uh, other part of, of the world. Um, and in, in general, a lot of our agricultural land is set aside for uh, traded products. We're not growing things that are by and large consumed locally or even in the same country. About a quarter of all of our agricultural land is growing food that is traded to another, uh, another country. About a quarter of all the food we produce is also traded to another country. And of the about eight or nine billion people on Earth, a billion of us rely on internationally traded food to meet our nutritional needs. So this sort of agricultural trade and connectivity of the system plays a large role uh, in agriculture as we know it today. Um, and again, this has some really interesting positive effects on short-term stability. Uh, so for one thing, it allows us to do what's called shifting or sequential exploitation. And so here I'm showing uh, graphs just of the rate of landings on the top of North Sea cod and on the bottom of Atlantic cod. And I've done the best job I could to try to line up the, the dates there. Um, but what happened in this system was that the North Sea cod started to collapse. And the, the UK importers of cod just simply shifted from North Sea cod to Atlantic cod. And by and large, UK consumers were completely unaware that their local fishery had totally collapsed. Because as far as they were concerned, they were still going to the store, to their fish and chips operation. They could still buy their, their cod. And so generally what we see is that national stability is actually increasing as a country's reliance on trade grows even though we see at the same time it contributes to this overall global instability of everybody growing the same, the same crops and therefore being communally uh, more susceptible to the same risks. So in, uh, expanded connectivity has a few other implications. So paradoxically, even though we're more connected, it weakens local feedbacks. So for example, uh, in one thing that intensification does is decouple production systems from natural processes. So I talked about how we're using more pesticides and fertilizers to sustain production uh, in place of where we might have used uh, manure or fed animals feed that was grown locally on the, on the farm. And that has a few impacts. So one thing it does is it can dampen some shocks because we can trade in order to get food to an area that's facing droughts, for example. Um, and that tends to happen when we have a high diversity of responses and relatively low connectivity. 
But it also amplifies shocks, and amplifies shocks in particular in systems where diversity is low and connectivity is high. And I would argue that in the global agricultural system that we have today, we really have a system where diversity is pretty low and our connectivity is high, and we're starting to see that these shocks uh, are getting amplified and not dampened because we are uh, reducing pressure on local systems in the near term, but at the expense of increasing fragility of the, of the overall system in our broader network. Okay, so, so in, in agriculture and in other production systems as well, the way we talk about this, we're moving towards more intensified systems, increasing use of anthropogenic input, more technology, more capital investment, more fossil fuel, and we're replacing our native agricultural resistance with what is sometimes called coerced resilience, uh, which is like a permanent but masked loss of options. Uh, and so let me walk you through these same ball and cup diagrams again. So again, the green ball is the state of our system, and we might start off in that nice little cup with a naturally resilient uh, agricultural system. And as we start to extract resources, extract crops from that system, we're altering the state of the system. We're pushing that green ball into another state. And if we do that enough, we see that we start to permanently change the system. The actual location of the bottom of that cup changes over time. If we keep doing that, it keeps changing the bottom of that cup until ultimately the bottom of that cup is so high that that green ball wants to roll out of the system that it's in and into an entirely new state, maybe one that doesn't produce crops anymore. And so what we do in that case is we continually start to increase the human input into that system to keep that green ball in the state that it's in. We want to maintain the stability of that agricultural system, maintain the stability of our production. And we've created in many places an agricultural system that works like this. And I would argue that our ag communities in many places are feeling the impossible pressure of being in this red queen situation where we're running as fast as we can just to stay in place. So we're replacing overall with all of these changes that we're making to our global agricultural system, replacing our agricultural resilience with this coerced resilience. and camouflaging uh, the precarious state of the system with, with human inputs. So let me talk about a few problems of coerced uh, uh, resilience. So one, um, we typically see in systems that are in this coerced resilience state that there is a continual increase in the need to compensate over time. So we need to add more and more and more uh, into the, the system. And that means that we're relying on outside systems that we can't uh, control. So I talked about historically maybe meeting needs for livestock on a farm, locally on that farm or on that property, but now our needs are being met by industrialized trade systems where livestock and feed production are decoupled. So we might be purchasing soybean feed from uh, Brazil that's traded to Europe to grow cattle in Europe, which means that Europe can't ignore, but also can't control Brazilian politics and Brazilian production or the droughts that might happen there. So it puts, a, uh, puts that system at risk. Uh, second, there are global limits to some of our inputs and therefore trade-offs in our capacity to coerce resilience in production systems, really fundamental limits. So if you think about it, there is a limited amount of rock phosphate available on the planet to make fertilizers. And when that is gone, we are not going to make phosphorus fertilizers anymore. So there's a really hard limit there uh, in our ability to continue to increase the inputs. Uh, and then finally, when species uh, and interactions that would normally contribute to supporting processes are lost, maybe uh, woodlands around farms that are harboring uh, natural predators of some of the pests on our farms or harboring pollinator species, when those processes are lost, it might remove our opportunities to return to a previously available situation. So you can't go back anymore to a situation where you're using native pollinators instead of trucking in bees. You're simply reliant on the bees because there's no habitat left anymore. 
So ultimately, I think this system, this coerced resilience, has allowed us to maintain these really high levels of production, but at the expanse of long-term ecological resilience uh, and the resilience of other systems that are connected to, to agriculture. And at the same time, our global interactions, our global connectivity has camouflaged the ecological signals of that loss, and indeed some of the cultural signals of that loss too. We see some of them as our rural communities uh, empty out, as our youth leave and, and head for cities, but we're largely able to hold these systems in this precarious uh, state. And, and to me, that means that we're losing options. And we're losing options at the very moment when rapid global change of all sorts is going to compel us to have more options and not fewer options. OK. So let me turn then to uh, thinking a little bit about what a resilient agriculture might look like. So if that's the state of our agriculture, and that's some of the problems that we're, that we're facing, and we're in this increasingly precarious state, what does a more resilient agriculture look like? If we think about one that is going to meet our needs for 10,000 years, our demands for agricultural products, our demands for rural communities that are essential for uh, human society, what does that look like? And I want to note in particular that this definition to me doesn't require that our production systems or our consumption systems are going to stay in any fixed kind of state, uh, or that we are able to continue any practice ad infinitum, but it explicitly allows for adaptive changes and even transformations in what we think of as agricultural system in order to meet evolving environmental needs, evolving environmental conditions, evolving human uh, needs. So in this sense, we're really thinking about a resilient system, one that has the capacity to tolerate change without shifting into a qualitatively different state. And to me, this requires that we start to reframe the discussion about sustainable agriculture from its current focus, where we often think about optimizing production. And I think that maybe 20 years ago or 40 years ago, that looked like optimizing production relative to economic costs. And I think now that actually looks quite a bit different. It looks like optimizing production relative to environmental costs, where we talk about more crop per drop. How can we grow food with less uh, environmental cost, less waste, uh, less pressure on our environment? And so we've done, we've shifted already in the way that we think about agricultural systems. But I would argue that now we need to shift a step further and ask how we can build a production system that meets all of our current challenges and forthcoming challenges. And if we think about 10,000 years, a lot of those challenges, we don't even know what they're going to be yet. So it's not like we can look out there and say, ah, I, I can see this thing coming. We can see some of those, right? We can see problems happening with our native pollinators. But there's a lot of things happening in 10,000 years that we can't, uh, can't even know are happening. And so my argument has been, in order to do that, we need to start to focus on all of the benefits that are provided by agricultural systems and not just the food that's being provided and not just the environmental benefits that are being provided. So uh, when I look at an, an agricultural system, so this is uh, the Monteregi where I've been working for the last uh, 10 years, a nice soybean field there. Um, and I will sometimes take a picture like this and bring it to my stakeholders and ask about, you know, so what are the benefits of this landscape to you? What do you see? Uh, and, and they might say, well, I see food. You're, you're growing soy, so there's food there. If I push a little more, they say, well, there's, there's wood. A lot of farmers are harvesting a little bit of wood from these woodlots and using that to heat their houses. Maple syrup is a really big product for us, so they, they might mention maple syrup. Uh, if I keep pushing more, I get things like pest regulation, water quality regulation, the carbon that's being stored to help regulate climate in that region and in those soils and in those trees. Uh, and then I might get things like, well, deer hunting. I'd like to go deer hunting in my woodlot, or I'd like to hike uh, on the, in the, the, the Mount Eregian hills that are here, or I just appreciate the aesthetic beauty of a beautiful landscape. Uh, and these are the ecological benefits. And then there's all sorts of social benefits that are happening here in ways that we're 
commu uh, connecting the communities that are on this landscape uh, as well. And so why is it important that we think about all of those things, all of the ecosystem services. Uh, and that is because if we focus on just one or two, we might miss some critical things. And so uh, here what I'm, I'm showing is uh, a conversion system where mangrove forests are being converted to shrimp matriculture in Thailand. And what this uh, does is provide an example of a trade-off between agricultural ecosystem services. So you get, do get an increase in shrimp production, obviously, if you start growing shrimp but we overall see a decline in the services that are being produced uh, in this landscape because we're losing fish habitat, we're losing uh, flood production, and we're losing wood production at the same time. And so what this analysis uh, by Barbier and his colleagues showed was that even when a small amount of coastal mangrove is converted to shrimp farming, we get this first like net, a little bit of net benefit in the beginning, and then a decrease as we convert more and more land and lose more and more services. So what we've been doing in the Monterigie then is working on uh, assessing all of the services that are provided in these landscapes. Everything that I mentioned before from maple syrup to forest recreation to tourism. A lot of people have summer cottages in this region. We're looking at a number of different things about the soil and of course the crop and pork production that the region is known for. And what we've been trying to do is understand whether different kinds of landscapes produce different bundles of services. So here on these petals, the length of the petal tells you how much of each service is being uh, produced. So you might have a landscape like the, the one on top there that's showing uh, a lot of forest recreation and carbon sequestration, but maybe not very much crop production. A landscape in the middle that has a lot of crop production and a lot of soil organic matter in the fields, but maybe not so much recreation, uh, or landscapes on the bottom that are a mix. And one of the things that we're interested in is can we pull one petal without affecting the others? In other words, if I want to increase my agricultural production, is that necessarily going to come with a decline in, uh, in water quality, or are these really, uh, uh, are these really independent? So we went out and we uh, measured a dozen different uh, ecosystem services all across this landscape of all different kinds. And we largely asked people which ones were important to them and, and decided that we would measure those. Uh, and what you're seeing here is the provision of those services in the Monteregie. So this is uh, just to the southeast of, of Montreal. And what I want you to see is for every service, it has a kind of unique pattern on the, the landscape. So uh, we get crops sort of somewhat close to Montreal. We get pork a little bit farther away. We get forest recreation still farther away. The deer hunting primarily happens between where the forests are and where the, the crops are. Um, so we get uh, some similarities but a really unique distribution. And those are patterns that when we think about the ways people are using this landscape, that, that distribution uh, makes sense to us on this landscape. And then we can think about the trade-offs. So this is just a correlation between all of the, the services. And I'm showing positive correlations, so services that go together on the landscape in blue and negative correlations, services that don't go together in red. And the darker the color, the stronger that correlation is. And I'll just draw your attention to two trends. So one is where we have our most intensively managed crop and pork production, we get a trade-off with almost every other service in this landscape, largely because of the way that we're managing those crop and pork production systems. Um, and at the same time, we get uh, synergies among carbon sequestration, soil organic matter, forest recreation, deer hunting, maple syrup production, all of those things tend to go together on the landscape. Where you have one, uh, you have, have others. And then we're able to go into those same landscapes and look at the synergies, so services that go together, and trade-offs, services that 
that push opposite against each other and don't go together uh, on that landscape, both due to simply the land use on the left-hand side, uh, and then that are independent from the land use, that are maybe about the spatial position and where we have things on the landscape uh, on the right-hand side. And, and what that allows us to do is get a deeper understanding of what those synergies and trade-offs look like and talk to our stakeholders and begin to suggest policies whereby they might be able to increase the synergies and reduce the strength of the trade-offs simply by changing the way that we're patterning the landscape by ensuring that there's more connectivity across the forested areas, for example, we can reduce the trade-offs and increase the, the synergies, even without changing the amount of crop production that we have on the landscape. So it allows us to pull apart those, uh, those petals. And then the other thing we've been doing in this landscape is looking back in time. So we've looked back in time uh, to the services that were provided in this landscape as early as the 1970s. And uh, what we find here is that services change all over the place. So from the 1970s to today, really just 40, almost 50 years that are shown in these graphs, not only does the individual service in time change, but the location of provision changes. So we used to have every municipality on this landscape providing a multifunctional mix of services. And as we move more and more towards recent years, provision gets much more specialized and each municipality focuses in on one or two services that they're gonna provide really efficiently uh, and, and effectively. And so the overall, our whole landscape provides the same amount of services, but where that's happening uh, on the landscape really has changed over time. And what we're doing now with this, and we've been doing this, I should say, with a set of stakeholders. So we've been working in the Monterey G. There are uh, 13 mayors that come together uh, to uh, organize this landscape with land use planners, uh, and that forms a sort of county. And we've been working with those mayors and with those land use planners to understand not just the system as it currently is and as it was in the past, but what the potential is for them in the future. And we've decided based on that experience to uh, expand out and look at other systems across Canada. And so we're going to uh, expand out, just starting right now, uh, to expand out to a series of other landscapes stretching from uh, agricultural areas in the Bay of Fundy and now moving, spreading a little bit out from agriculture into other kinds of working landscapes as well. So uh, in Quebec, looking at peat mining and forestry, um, at looking at prairie drainage in the, in the prairie areas, at energy development in Alberta and British Columbia, at fisheries in the west, and then in the Northwest Territories, which is mostly peatland right now, actually looking at what's the potential for agricultural expansion in a province that's never really had much agriculture before. What happens when you uh, dig up that peatland and put agriculture? What happens to carbon sequestration? What happens to the massive food insecurity in the local communities? What happens to their ability to uh, hunt what we call country food or, or the local indigenous foods that people would be, be eating? Uh, and we're working on this uh, in, in each landscape. We have leads in those landscapes and they're launching again with their stakeholders, which is sometimes Department of Agriculture, uh, sometimes a, a local First Nations tribe, um, sometimes a, a provincial or, or state government, launching with those uh, stakeholders, these efforts to try to understand the services that are provided and what the potential is gonna bring uh, to those uh, services. So that project is called uh, ResNet. Um, and overall, we have some science goals too. And those are really about improving our ability to model ecosystem services and to build decision support tools. Every one of those communities, I talked a little bit about the, the Northwest Territories, but every one of those communities is facing some sort of very difficult decision about ecosystem services. So uh, for example, in the Bay of Fundy, the Department of Agriculture there manages a series of about 80 so odd um, dikelands. And those dikes are holding back the sea. 
Uh, and in, in holding back the sea, they're allowing agriculture to happen by keeping the salt water out. But the Department of Agriculture has come to the realization they can't afford to maintain all of those dikelins anymore. They can afford to maintain about 60. And they want to know which 20 they can divest from. Uh, and so what we can do is go in and measure the ecosystem services implications of that. How is farming going to change? How is recreation going to change? How is who gets to recreate going to change? Uh, and we're doing that by a uh, very similar process, going out, measuring ecosystem services uh, on all of these landscapes, a similar set uh, in, in all of five in all the landscapes. And then every landscape has some that are unique to that landscape. Doesn't make sense to measure uh, maple syrup in Pacific coastal fisheries, but it makes a lot of sense to measure it in Quebec, for example. Um, and building from there to try to improve our ability to model ecosystem services, to manage and govern them, uh, and to monitor them over the, the long term. And the reason that we're interested in monitoring them over the long term is that Canada has expressed an interest in being a leader uh, in monitoring ecosystem services, especially in its production landscapes. Uh, but there's a lack of knowledge of what to measure or how to measure it. So if we want to measure things not just in individual landscapes, but at the scale of a whole country, what does that dashboard look like? You know, so I'm showing a, a, an airplane uh, dashboard, but we want to envision something similar to that that would give us a sense of what's the state of Canada's ecosystems and natural capital? What's the resilience of Canada at this moment? And what do we need to monitor in order to understand uh, what the resilience of that, that system is? Uh, so if you want to find out more about that, we're just in the first four months of that, just getting going. Uh, but we have a website, and you can learn a little bit more uh, about the really diverse group. There's about, uh, about 50 scientists right now. We will eventually have about 100 uh, graduate students working on that project, and we have about 45 different government and industry uh, stakeholder partners who are uh, engaging with us in that, in that project. Okay, so let me just quickly come uh, back around to kind of the, the, the big picture of, of agriculture uh, and um, where we're at with the state of agriculture and resilience, and especially this question of resilience, long-term resilience, 10,000 years, and stability. And I started off by saying that agriculture is fundamental to human well-being, but is also paradoxically the single biggest cause of environmental degradation. And we're really living through the situation right now of trying to figure out how are we going to uh, how are we going to cope with that. We've made a lot of changes to the agricultural system. We're doing things to become more efficient. Um, I want to first start by saying what I think it's it's not. Um, so agriculture is not resilient if it is financially profitable but undermining biodiversity. That's not resilient. Uh, if it's producing food um, but is not being economically viable in, a, in any local community setting, that's also not resilient. If we're causing long-term or widespread environmental crises, uh, it's not resilient no matter how economically successful it is or how much food is being uh, produced. And so all of that leads me to believe that just having a marginally greener revolution, so this sort of incremental increases in efficiency, is really unlikely to be uh, enough and is probably setting us up for a bigger fall down the road. And so what I would encourage is that we start to search for really large systemic changes in practices, in institutional arrangements that will allow our agricultural systems and our agricultural communities to be productive in the long term without being static. So how can we enhance our capacity to adapt and even our capacity to transform to disturbance as we move, uh, as we move forward in the system? And to me, to encourage that kind of agriculture it, it implies something somewhat radical, and I think it implies that we need to be doing a lot of experimentation, sort of bold experimentation that, that builds on solutions that are at different scales. So we need scales from the farm to the planet that are experimenting, and we need to set up systems and policies that allow us to get rid of practices that are inefficient 
if something's not providing opportunities for innovation or it's maladaptive, we need to be able to get rid of that rather than subsidizing it into a hardened, uh, a hardened state and really lean into this kind of uh, radical experimentation, innovation, and learning, even if that sometimes reduces our short-term efficiency, which we have always been, been aiming for. And to do that, that probably means that we need to do a better job of protecting our farmers and our farm communities so that we're not feeling too much the effects. We wanna feel the effects enough to notice the feedbacks, to see what kinds of adjustments are needed, to adapt and transform as needed, but not so much that we're, we're putting our own uh, communities out of, out of business. So to build a resilient agriculture for the next 10,000 years, we're going to resist focus on single solutions to near-term problems, but instead move towards experimentation, diversity of solutions that really allow for adaptation and transformation. So let me come all the way back around to planetary boundaries and to the Anthropocene and to say, you know, I think that we have an obligation to the creatures and ecosystems with which we share the planet uh, and to ourselves to care for what's around us. We're living in an age where we are dominating the systems that are here on the planet. Uh, and we need to do that and live in a way that is responsible, that is protecting our own security and protecting that of the ecosystems around us. And the way to do that is to pay attention to the resilience of these systems, the social ecological systems, the ecological systems, and to really be thinking about what it is to be a human in the Anthropocene. Thank you. So, I don't have a clock, but I do think I can answer things up for, open things up for questions. And there's microphones in the audience. Sorry, excuse me. Hi, thank you. That was great. I was just curious in your Bay of Fundy example mm -hmm. or your other ResNet work, how are you uh, incorporating non monetary valuation? in some of these trade-off functions you're modeling, and how does that go over with, for example, the Ministry of Agriculture? Yep, okay, so, um, so it's a, a question about, you know, how, how are we coping with some services? You can put a dollar value on them very easily. It's a crop that's sold. We know exactly how much that's worth. Other things like the beauty of the landscape are much harder to, to value monetarily. So we have kind of sidestepped that, <laughs> I'll admit, um, because what we end up doing is we rely very little on monetary valuation and a lot more on biophysical estimations and then bringing those back to the communities and saying, okay, you decide. Like, I'm not gonna decide for the Department of Agriculture which uh, dikes they should divest from, but what I can say to them is, if you get rid of these, you know, this set of 20, here's what you're gonna get, here's how much agricultural production you're gonna have, here's what kind of recreation you're gonna have and how much of it, here's how much carbon is gonna be store, stored. If you get rid of these 20 on the other hand, here's how much of those things you're gonna get. Now you decide what it is that you want. And, and in part that's a sidestepping, it makes my job easier. But in part it's also, it's not really my place to decide. I don't live in that community. What I hope is by having, by doing this work with the communities, really deeply with the communities, and we hold workshops every year with, uh, with our stakeholders and with other community members that are interested, that we're also providing a place to have those conversations so that they're starting to engage and that the Department of Agriculture is hearing from people, you know, no, don't get rid of that. We, we like this piece or, you know, no, that one's okay to get rid of, or at least sort of understanding what the tensions are there. Thanks, good question. Um, when I was looking, or when I was seeing your uh, talking about resilience and, and with how, uh, looking back to your slide, you were talking about how the 
Uh, crops have reduced in variety, down from mm -hmm. many to so many fewer. Um, have you, or any of your um, data that you've looked at, looked at the influence of larger farms and kind of the loss of smaller farms? Like I know we have, we've had that here in the U.S., especially in the last 30 to 40 years, but globally, I know that's another larger issue. Have, have you studied that and taken that into account uh, with your studies? Yeah, so it's hard to it's hard to know, you know, anytime that we're talking about cause and effect, and it's hard to know exactly what the cause and effect are. And and even when I was putting together these slides, I kept moving things around because I kept redeciding what I thought the cause and effect really were. But all of those things are connected together, right? So um, the certainly the size of farms changes the kind of mechanization that we're able to use, and changing the mechanization means that you're putting a lot of capital into uh, buying big machines, and then it's much more difficult to change what you're, what you're growing than it would be if you've got a bunch of small crops. So, there's, so some of that is about you know, farm size, some of that is about mechanization, some of that is about trade too, right? Once you've got a trade system set up that can easily move what crop that you've got to you know, wherever it is, your local co-op, and from there off to wherever it's gonna, gonna go, it becomes much harder to switch that, that system around and do anything else. So somehow in there, that sort of intensification, farm size, trade, all of those things are working together to push in the same direction. Yeah. And my, that's sort of a microcosm of what you're talking about, my own family farm. You know, my, my father farmed, he used to tell us about, you, you know, you better raise hogs and cattle and ch chickens with your crops because one or the other will work out. Okay, that's the way it was. Well, over the course of time, over those, oh, not 600 acres, now it's a single thing and it's intense. Mm -hmm. And my point is, I don't see who makes the change first. I don't think my brother who's farming it can decide to do something else because he'll go broke doing it. The system, it's like it's a surf. So how do you, where does it start? Yeah, I mean, I, I hear that a lot and I, and I get it, right? We've created a larger system that, that essentially makes it so that as you're saying, or at least as I think I understand you saying, your brother doesn't have any choice in what that looks like if he wants to stay afloat. And I think a lot of, of farmers and a lot of farm communities are finding themselves in that situation where, you know, I called it the red queen, where you're just running as fast as you can, as intense, as efficient, as single thing as you can just to stay at the, at the bare edge. And we, we have just over time, right, gradually that system has shifted into a system where I think a lot of people are, are looking out and seeing that. You know, I don't think any one person or policy has driven us that direction. It's this combination of a lot of things. But the question that I'm really interested in and that I don't honestly know the answer to is, how do you change that so that it becomes possible for someone who wants to change to be able to change? And not everybody does. But the opportunity should be there for someone who wants to experiment with, oh, I'm gonna, I, I would like to experiment with trying more kinds of things. How can I be financially protected? How can I be culturally protected through whatever mechanism to be able to do that experiment and see if that, if that works or not without having to say, well, if I do that experiment and it doesn't work, then this family farm is gone. And we should be looking, seeking ways that we can open up that, that possibility for people. Come in here. I can, I can, you can probably hear me. I can hear you. And I can okay. repeat if other people don't hear you. I, I worked in, okay. <laughs> no choice. I worked in biomass energy for 20 years and uh, it hasn't gone over yet. And the, the, the issue, there are two major issues, and it's money and politics. And uh, one of the things that I said, do you have any economists on your team? Yes. Okay, it's very important to get the economists in there so you can deal with dollars. Somebody's going to have to pay for these services, and who's gonna pay, and who's going to be the recipients? And that's the critical issue right there. Yeah, yeah, we do, and we, at the moment, we have mostly behavioral economists, but we need, for sure, we need to grow that, 
that team because it's critical. And I think also for us, like political scientists, we, we have an issue in Canada where our funding can either be for natural science or social science, and economics in that system sits in social science, and we're not allowed to write that into our proposal. So now we're just sort of sneaking people in and sort of building that part of our project. But it's, it's really critical. Thanks. Oh, yep. You mentioned such things as the dikes and the Bay of Fundy and the, and the mining of peat uh, in the Northwest. How are you working short and long-term climate change models into your overall economics models and production models? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And every at the moment, all of our landscapes are handling that differently. And some of them, like the Northwest Territories, the long-term climate models are... are Super important that by a funding, actually, it's also really important because sea level rise is the big thing that they're fighting. It's less of a critical uh, issue in Quebec, and so it's not as, as strong of an issue there. Um, but we're going to have to see how we try to build that in because it's affecting all of these systems. It's affecting even our fisheries system in the West Coast, too. So there's a bit of a, of, of a mix at the moment, but like I said, we're only four months in, so still to be seen. Thanks. So most of my experience dealing with ecosystem services, I hear. Oh, yep, great, <laughs> <And> thank you. <laughs> most of the NGOs around the world are interested in working with small shareholders. Mm -hmm. And I've long argued that if you really want to make a difference on a planetary basis, you have to deal with large landscapes. So how do you, to tie in with the previous questions, how do you deal with the economics? Somebody has to pay, it's going to take governmental support to, to drive some of these decisions. I mean, many farmers are doing a lot of things in the right way today, but just yep. not enough of them are to really have a global impact. Yeah, well, so we have to somehow scale up, and that's a big, with, the, with this ResNet project, it's a big part of what we're trying to do by engaging. So our primary end uh, client is Statistics Canada through their efforts to try to build a national monitoring system and their ability to work with, with government um, to, to take that monitoring system and actually do something with it and impart policies. And, you know, our government has started to say that they're feeling this lack of data in their ability to put policies in place that they want to put in place. We'll see if providing the data actually changes things. I mean, I, I, I personally think, and it's really just, it's not based on data, it's really just my belief that some of the changes that are coming are gonna be painful and hard. Um, and, and that is gonna require government to step in and, and pay for things in a way that, that it hasn't so far or require some sort of changes, but it, it's, it's, it's not gonna be smooth. Uh, you spoke to the interconnectedness of the international agriculture markets, that that's a large amount of, a large proportion of what our production goes to is international trade. Mm -hmm. Do the international trade agreements at the political level have a homogenizing or, or sort of calcifying effect on what local producers feel able to produce? That's a good question, and I do not know the answer to that. I don't know if anybody else here knows the answer to that. My, my guess is that it's a combination. Some of that must, if not calcify, it must set the economics up in a way that, that pushes people in one direction or another, but I, but I don't honestly have the data to know. Somebody does. Thank you for your thought-provoking uh, talk. I, you're especially bold to ask us to look out 10,000 years. <laughs> I admit to being pretty uncomfortable that when I have a hard time looking out, most of us in this room probably don't look out more than a few months or maybe a year. I'm working on next year's crop plan right now, as many of us here. So thank you for trying to inspire us. Um, I, I guess my, my challenging us to be radical, I think, is maybe appropriate. But history has shown that radical or revolutions don't end well. Uh, and we're stuck, it seems, with incrementalism. And so my question to you mm. is, 
we not, if we don't get to radical, how can we improve the working together part? And, and it seems to me you're trying to address that in your inventorying of natural systems. Now, I admit to you, I'd be, I, I'm very, I would not want to be in the committee trying to value those services, because I, I think that'd be one hell of a debate. But uh, I am concerned that as I read, uh, partly inspired by this uh, a talk like this three or four years ago, reading much of the literature, we seem to divide very quickly into camps, into silos, into tribes. And I think we all have a lot to offer, but most of us go to the conferences and listen to people who agree with us. So my question is, if you have any advice, how can we work together better? Okay. That's a great question. So, um, no, it's good. It, 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 you gave me some time to think there while you were while you were while you were asking, which was good. Um, so, so I mean, I can just speak from personal experience. So, when we started in the Monterey, we decided I decided that it was going to be really important to get people who didn't agree with us and who didn't agree with each other in the room and to try to just figure out how to make that work. And that was, gosh, almost 15 years ago. So it was a, before, I think, there was this growing sense that we were in, in different camps. And, and we tried a couple of different things. And, and one of the things that has worked really well is scenario development. So we we met with people over time, and I, and I will say that when I started, and, and so I'm working there, and I'm working all in French, and my French is not that great, and especially we have an agricultural producers union, and, and the guy, Thomas, from the agricultural producers union kind of came in and kind of sat like that for almost a year of these meetings. And, and, you know, I would try to ask him what was going on, but my French is not that great. You know, we have these conversations, and, and finally, are you just trying to take my land away? No, I don't want to take your land away. And we, you know, so we, we, but it took a long time. Like you had to, I had to develop that relationship. And by the end of that five-year project, he was one of our strongest supporters of just, you know, enthusiastically engaging, of getting his buddies to come along. And I think part of what we were able to do was, was get people to think, in our scenarios, we're only pushing people 25 years into the future, so not 10,000, and to ask them, you know, what's the future of this region going to look like in 25 years? So they're, they're not engaging with the, with the things that make them camp into different camps, right? It's, this is just all imagined. So they can have a little bit more free-flowing conversations, and we set up a situation where nobody's right, nobody's wrong, you have to listen, we make a lot of ground rules about how they're gonna engage with each other. And if you do that enough times, they can at least start to talk to each other. So that, you know, I remember a moment where our local representative from our Chamber of Commerce kind of went, ah, Suburban development is not all good for me. You know, and she had walked in thinking, this is, I know where I want this place to go, and now I'm having an aha moment where it's not exactly where I want it to go. And I think all of us, like I had that for myself of what I thought the region should look like, and, and I walked out five years later thinking, I don't think I was right about that. But it's setting up repeated opportunities to come together and talk about something that isn't, um, where are we going to build this bridge, or isn't something that's already got them politically divided, and then setting really firm ground rules about, about how to engage. And they're still, they still meet. Like we're, you know, we're, not, we're not doing that project anymore, but they still, they still meet and, and get together and talk. So hopefully that's at least a sign. But what I don't know, and what we're trying now with ResNet, is how do you scale that up? You know, we did that in one small community with 13 mayors. How do you do that in a whole country? No idea. I'll find out. I have a question from um, an online audience member. She's actually tuning in from Mexico City, a colleague of ours. Um, the question is, how do we overcome the basic human instinct to value long-term stability slash strength over the short-term gains as individuals, as organizations, um, as other entities? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really, really hard one, right? Because you can't, I can't ask uh, a farmer in my local region to forego their own personal short-term economic stability for my long-term environmental gain. That just doesn't make any sense. So the, the only way that I can see to do that is to put policies in place that make it safe for a person to experiment around the edges of that, of that stability in a way that, that you can see the feedbacks, you can understand what's happening, um, but it's not, it's not so painful that you're risking your farm or your house or, or, or whatever it is. That's the only way that I can think of. There may be other ways out there too. Which is a great answer because it ties into actually her next question, which is um, how do we, inside that kind of policy making, how do we, um, you know, if these, if these producers are expected to um, have these fairly big experimentations going on, you know, that takes some policy to drive in, how do we in, mm -hmm. excite and entice that policy? Yeah, I mean, it takes, it takes some policies to drive that, and then it also takes, you know, universities to engage with with that also, right? It's, it's, it's one thing to do the experiment, but somebody has to also then collect the data and understand what that experiment means and be looking at all of the experiments and understanding where that, that drives. And I think that's why I'm excited about the kinds of things that are going on here uh, in terms of thinking about resilience, in terms of thinking about environmental security, because that's that's a setup of a group of people with a wide ranging expertise that have potential to, if a policy was in place or if people were willing to experiment to understand what that means. Um, so given the global import, uh, the global interconnectedness and how important that is for the system, is there work like this being done in differing cultural or political societies around the world? Oh, work like, like the sort of measuring of ecosystem services? Yeah. I think there are places that it is that it is starting to happen. So I know of colleagues who are working, uh, like in Transylvania and Eastern Europe. Uh, I know some groups that are working on this in Ethiopia. Um, I know some groups that are working on this uh, in different agricultural areas in Mexico. So I see little places of it happening, and we actually just recently, um, uh, I guess not just recently, but I've just recently joined a group. Uh, uh, called the Program for Ecosystem Change and Society that ha hosts a number of different groups that are doing this kind of thing so that we can start to talk about, and what, are you, what are you seeing over there? Is that the same thing that I'm seeing over here to try to understand how those things might be different or similar across cultures? Great question. Yep. I have one last comment and question. You know, we're challenged, it looks like, in the next 30 years to increase our feed and food production to be almost double in the next 30 years. Uh, as a feed and food producer, I've seen the real impact since the day I was born. Uh, things like hybridization of corn came about. We've made extremely big advances in technology and genetics and so forth. In your modeling then, what does this look like uh, to feed the world? Uh, how does this fit into your plans with some of the eco ec ecological things you have? to double our food production in the next 30 years? It's, it's the idea of doubling food production, I have to say, is, is scary. I mean, that is what the models show. If I, if I step back and take a slightly bigger systems approach to that, um, because I don't, when I look forward, and I mean, there may be some technological changes that allow us to make those sorts of leaps like hybridization um, that allow us to increase production. But I'd like to also see us take a step back and say, okay, well, one thing we could do is reduce food waste. So we know that it, we're wasting about 30% or maybe even a little bit more of our food in different ways in different places. Some of that's being wasted uh, just when grains are being stored in some parts of the world. Some of that, like here, is, is plate waste or refrigerator waste or restaurant 
waste, but that could be a huge impact on in a need to double food production suddenly looks like a lot less if you say, well, we could just reduce our, our food waste, or if we could change the way that we're trading food and get better at getting the right kinds of nutrients to, to people in different parts of the world, maybe we can get that number down from a doubling to something that looks a little bit more reasonable. Um, so, when you're looking at all these like all these areas, are you finding that the land is typically agreeing with native species that used to uh, habitate those lands, or are they, or have they changed uh, what they're like what they're agreeing with when you're growing there? Sorry, what do you mean? What they're agreeing with? Like, I mean, like what what like grows uh, what 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 grows naturally there. Does that make sense? In, yeah, I mean, so I think what grows naturally in places is actually itself changing. So if I think about like the Northwest Territories, what has been growing there is, is peat and caribou. Um, and that is not what is gonna be growing there in 20 years. They're talking about wheat um, and, and, other, and other grains. So I think most of the places that I've been working are just so far away from uh, from native species. So in the, in the Monteregi, we have these Monteregian hills that are volcanic intrusions. And we do see, like there, it's mostly forested. But in the lowland agricultural areas, there's little bits of forest left, but those are mostly secondary forests. They're not even uh, primary or native forests. So a lot of these systems are just really far changed from uh, what would have been the native species in them. Um, so I recently overheard a conversation with a much older gentleman that um, within 100 years, Alaska will revert back to its natural state no problem, which is, I'm pretty sure that's not quite right. Hmm. Okay. So um, how can I explain or we explain to other people like him why that's not right? Ooh, that's a hard question. <laughs> Um, so I, what I see, I mean, you know, some places, some things, if left alone, some parts of them are going to go back. Um, separate from some of the things that I've talked about here, we've done now some long-term studies of what happens to ecosystem service provision in the old growth forests on the, the West Coast. And one of the things that we see in those systems is that even over a, a 300 year period, you never get back some of the, the services. They just, don't, they just don't ever go back to what they were. You get new things, and sometimes those new things are, are fine. Sometimes they're, they're better. They're things that we, that we want more out of that, that area. But generally, it's hard for things don't go back to exactly how they were, in, in part because we've got this coerced resilience of the systems, right? We're, we're just changing where that, I would call it the basin of attraction, but where the bottom of that, that loop is in a way that isn't necessarily gonna, that isn't necessarily gonna go back. Possible, maybe over thousands of years. It's hard to think about that time period, but hundreds, eh, less likely. Hi. Hi. Uh, so I'm an advertising student, so this is not really my main field, but uh, uh, sustainability in all its forms is something, it's a cause most brands have taken, taken up and it shows in their uh, advertising. And so my question was, I mean, it was more of a, uh, the question is more about like, will it answer the economic viability uh, concerns if these brands kind of uh, agree to kind of uh, like, you know, like they agree to do business with farms that are more sustainable. So would that work? I mean, that certainly has to be part of the, that certainly, to, at least to me, has to be part of the, 
the solution. We often have these debates, right, about can, should, should this be about individual action? Is this about government policy? Is this about corporate responsibility? Um, and the answer is it's probably about all three of those things in different places at different times. But it probably, at least in my mind, isn't going to happen if we rely on only one of those. So if we just say, well, every individual just has to do the right thing, we're not going to get there. Or if we just say, you know, oh, this is just about corporate branding and, and doing the right thing in corporations, eh, we're probably not going to get there either. And if we just leave it up to government, we're probably not going to get there. But to me, when, when you see change like that that has happened in the past, it's when all of those things, for whatever reason, you know, good leadership, uh, really bad things happening. So I think I'm very curious to see what happens now in Australia with all the, the fires that are happening. Does that sort of crisis create change? But then you, know, you need that crisis and then some leadership and other things that happen that pull all of those things, governance, government, economics, individuals, corporations, all pulling in the same direction to get anywhere. Thanks. With, with that, Elena, we'll Thanks. save you. <laughs> thank, let's thank Elena, like Dr. Bennett, one more time. Thanks. A, a medal. Hey, yeah, look at that. That's yeah. really cool. Thank Great. You. Great. Thank you. It's a lot of fun. Thanks again, and thanks to each of you for uh, joining us, uh, both those of you here in Lincoln and those online, as we heard, from around the world. Um, our next Uerman lecture will be in April and we'll take a slight pivot on the theme of resilience and really start uh, moving into resilience in terms of our rural community prosperity, the drivers of economic vitality for rural Nebraska, and workforce development and something called structural unemployment. So uh, stay tuned for a, an announcement for our third and final Hewerman of this season. Thanks for all of your support. Thanks again, Dr. Bennett, for your thought-provoking comments, and have a safe trip home. <laughs>